We need 5,000 likes on this video. Hey, what's up, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Spotify Radio. Hey, guys, how you doing? It's your man, Mr. Charles, back with another episode of Charles Real Talk Podcast, where we keep it real, we keep it 100, we keep it authentic, real talk, real people, real subjects. Tonight, y'all, we're going to jump into part two of Dr. Thomas Saul, uh, Myth of Economic Inequality. Uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to check out part one yet. If you haven't, you want to watch or listen to part one before you jump into this part right here. This is part two as we wind down this um, video, this reaction video on Dr. Thomas Saul on this um, myth of economic inequality. Um, that's a recap from last night, guys. You really touched on some real serious issues dealing with not only the black community here in uh, this country, but uh, in poverty communities around the world. Uh, he also touched on uh, inner city um, uh, crimes and stuff like that. Why stuff like that happens in the inner city. He also touched on uh, the minimum wage issues as well. He touched on a lot of great topics last night, including affirmative action that um, is, was such a big issue a few years ago as well. Now, guys, once again, if you haven't, if you haven't checked out part one, go back and check out part one first. And uh, therefore, you can be caught up on what he's talking about currently. Um, understand that this is only a reaction video to educate the people because the people need to be educated as well as myself. So we're going to jump into this thing. Part two. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. If you haven't subscribed to the uh, Spotify channel, go ahead. Spotify station, go ahead and do that as well. Leave a like, comment below. Let me know you like the contents of this channel. And man, we hope that you guys really do because we answer all comments that are left down below. So with that being said, we're going to jump into part two of Dr. Thomas Saul on the myth of economic inequality. Let's get it. Let's go. Um, Both from the last affirmative action case to reach the Supreme Court, last big affirmative action case to reach the Supreme Court, 2003, uh, Grutter versus Bollinger. Here's the majority opinion, which was written by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, quote, the court expects that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary. This upholding the use of, in a decision, 5-4 decision, upholding the use of racial preferences. Now, that's quotation one. Here's quotation two, Justice Thomas, Justice Clarence Thomas, in a dissent. Quote, I believe that blacks can achieve in every avenue of American life without the meddling of university administrators. The court holds that racial discrimination and admissions should be given another 25 years. While I agree that in 25 years these practices will be illegal, they are illegal now. <laughs> Close quote. So, here's, what do you do with the argument that Justice O'Connor, writing that majority opinion, there's something of the constrained vision there. Look, we have these, all universities across the country are using these racial preferences to as the basis of admission the best we can hope to do is tell them they ought not to be doing it that they should be developing other standards and give them a give them a clock is that <laughs> that's a, is that a reasonable thing to do no but it's a universal thing to do uh, i wrote a book about, about affirmative action it was, it was called affirmative action around the world and I made a couple of uh, international trips at the expense of the Hoover Institution uh, around the world to check out affirmative action. This is one of the one of the most common arguments, and it's absolutely fallacious time and time again. The argument that, that like so much in the unconstrained vision, it assumes that we have a power that we do not have, cannot have, and never have had. Yeah. Uh, in, in England, there was a man named Scarman who was saying, "For the now, we must do this in order to." Uh, and in many countries, these pre these programs were set up with an actual cutoff date. So it was set up with, in in Malaysia with a cutoff date, I think, of around it, it was set with 1990. And in Pakistan, I, it was like it was supposed to go for 10 years. Mm -hmm. None of those th the cutoff dates has met 
a, a, a thing. These programs not only continue, they increase, they spread. So the idea that you can control the future uh, because of these wonderful sounding words, I can't think of a country in the world where, where, where that's ever happened. Uh, in the case of Pakistan, they did have an actual, actual cutoff date. Uh, and because the people in East Pakistan were, for whatever historical reason, way behind the people in West Pakistan. And so there's these preferences for East Pakistanis. Now, before time for this thing to expire, the East Pakistanis uh, seceded from Pakistan and formed a new nation of Bangladesh. Bangladesh, right. And the preferences continued right on because there were other groups that had been added to it. And so once you get the constituency, you can't say no to them. I see. It, 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 is, it is an argument that, that, that has never worked out anywhere that I've been able to, to, to check. All right. So Tom Sowell says no to the welfare state, no to affirmative action. What is to be done? And now you were kind enough to share with me uh, uh, the galleys of your forthcoming edition of Discrimination and Disparities. Let me give you a few quotations from some of the new, the new chapter in yeah. that book. Quote, the poverty rate among black married couples has been less than 10% every year since 1994. As far back as 1969, young black males whose homes included newspapers, magazines, and library cards had similar incomes to those of their white counterparts. Academic outcomes show a pattern of disparities similar to the pattern of disparities in the amount of time devoted to schoolwork. Apparently, Lifestyle choices have consequences. Yes. Close quote. So this is the constrained vision once again. Welfare state, that's government. We don't rely on that. Affirmative action, government. We don't rely on that. We rely on hard work. We rely on the institution of marriage. Is, is, that's correct? Yes, in other words, the, these things, I, I don't think it's the marriage as such or the library cards as such. It's that there are lifestyle choices that have been made. And the, and the comparison I made was, was between, if you look at the poverty rate among blacks, uh, uh, it was 22%. And among whites, it was 11%. But among black married couples, it was 7.5%. Right. So it's not so they not only do better than blacks as a whole, they do better than whites as a whole. And so it's, 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 so, so it's lifestyle choices. Similarly, with, with the results in the, some of these uh, more successful charter schools, that uh, you have these kids not only uh, meeting but exceeding the national standards in places like ha Harlem and Bedford Divers in the South Bronx. And these are not kids who are cr skimming the crown cream. They're kids chosen by lottery. They don't even test them for ability. They don't even look at their academic records. They take them into the schools and they, and they, and they have hard work and they, they make it clear at the outset and they don't tolerate a lot of nonsensical behavior. Uh, and, and, and these kids are doing incredibly. So, Tom, here, again, I think back to the Moynihan, well, no, I think, so the Moynihan report in 65, and he was very alarmed by uh, the, the illegitimacy rate of 25% among African Americans. By the way, in fairness to the late Moynihan, we should point out, one reason he was alarmed by this was his own, his own father had walked out on the family That's when he was right. 10 years old. He experienced what it meant yes. to be to kids to have one parent. Okay. And now it's all gotten dramatically worse for whites and Hispanics and black, for everybody. Mm. And then I think back beyond that to your experience of Harlem, you drop out of high school and do what? Go on welfare? Start cashing? For, no, you went to work. And you spent some of that money to buy some inexpensive encyclopedias. Yeah. And the, t the Harlem was sick. So, but I feel this uh, council, it's, it's almost a council of despair in that that world just seems so utterly vanished. No, well, no question. You, but do, so your argument is if, if we can stand up to the welfare state, we can somehow get back to that world? The fam family structure will reassert itself? Oh, that, that's going to that, that's be reconquering the same ground, which is really tough to do. But it can, it can be done. Uh, I was I was so lucky. I, I at the time I had no no clue about all this. I left home uh, at, at the uh, in 1948. Uh, many decades later, I learned that the uh, 
uh, unemployment rate among black teenagers in 1948, 16, 17-year-olds, was 9.4%. Uh, among whites, so the same age, it was 10.2%. So both blacks and white teenagers had only a fraction of the unemployment that they have today. Uh, you were expected to work. You were expected to be able to get a job. And more, more importantly, the jobs were there for you. Uh, and so, and what, what, this is because of the fluke, really. The, 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 the minimum wage law in the United States, Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, uh, was passed with specified rates of pay that you're supposed to get. Uh, almost immediately, uh, inflation took off during the 1940s. So by 1948, those numbers that were in the law were meaningless. Oh, I see. In other words, when I started out as a Western Union messenger, the minimum wage was 40 cents an hour. I started out at the bottom at 65 cents an hour. So it was the same as if there was no minimum wage. And this is what happened. You had this and I was so lucky, I knew, of course, had no clue about any of this. Now, now a, a black kid, 20 years later, comes in there. Uh, they've now, they, 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 people have become compassionate. They've raised the minimum wage, so he can't get a job. Got it. And I don't think it does any, any community any good to have a whole lot of t teenage uh, males hanging around on the streets with no job and nothing to do. Right. Tom, so, but, but, Another thought here. You're describing a world, Harlem, the urban world, gone. Yes. You, but you made visits when you were young. You knew the South as well, didn't you? Did you, you, you went back to the South when you were young from time to time? I say uh, back to the South because, uh, as I recall, you were born in the South. Yeah, like, yeah I went, went to New York. Went to New York. Yeah, uh, well, I, th I think this was courtesy of the Marine Corps, uh, which happened to locate the uh, boot camp in South Carolina. But what I'm, and Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Okay. So what I'm getting at is, you're of the generation that saw Jim Crow with your own eyes. Oh, no eyes. question. No question. Okay. So, well, here's, let me read you a quotation. This is from an article that got a lot of attention in The Atlantic a couple of years ago called The Case for Reparations by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Quote, white supremacy is a force so fundamental to America that it is difficult to imagine the country without it. Reparations is the price we must pay to see ourselves squarely." Close quote. And Tom Sowell, who actually saw Jim Crow with his own eyes and experienced it, responds, how? It would be nice to know his uh, evidence for what he said, just to be old-fashioned about it. Uh, no, it, 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 it was a rotten system. But I don't know how, how, how we get from that to reparations. I mean, what we see in the United States in terms of the bad things, you see all around the world. If you were to give reparations to everyone whose ancestors had been slaves, I suspect that you would have to give reparations to more than half the entire population of the globe. Slavery was not confined to one set of races. I suspect that most of the people who were either slaves or slave owners around the world were neither white nor black. I mean, this was, this was a universal curse of the human species. Africa, the Middle East, Asia, oh, slavery and, 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 and it continued elsewhere long after uh, it, it was abolished in the Western countries. Right. Let me try as, uh, t sticking with ta Coates. Coates. It's Shelby talk, Shelby Steele talks about white guilt. Mm. And in ta Coach Coates, you get almost the counterpart of that, uh, a kind of African-American claim against the white guilt. And this seems, it, beginning with the abolitionists, even beginning before the Civil War, mm. you seem almost every generation, there's some expression that racism and slavery, as Shelby calls it, the si correctly, of course, the sin of slavery is so deeply, and it's something we still live with. How do we expiate it? How do we get past it? Is there something we can do to relieve ourselves of this legacy? Oh, I think you should repeat it. If you were a slave owner, I don't see a reason why you should feel differently. On the other hand, if I can't get over the idea of A, apologizing for what B did. Okay. Uh, even when they're contemporaries, much less when, 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 when one is dead and the other is alive. 
Yeah, right. I mean, I, I, Scalia, I remember saying, you know, that uh, I, 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 I owe no man anything uh, because uh, pe people who look like me called, did something to people who look like him. Okay, so just get past it. Get yeah. to work. Yeah. All right. Tom Sowell's view is get an education, stay married, and do your job. Roughly. Yeah. All right. Charles Murray. I'm taking, you used to write a column every so often called Random Thoughts on the Passing oh, yes, Scene. Yes. And so I'm giving you a little, little snippets here of the passing scene as a, in our final questions. Charles Murray, in his 1984 book, Losing Ground, and Charles Murray writes about discussions in academia and government about the effort to close the gap again between African Americans and whites. Quote, 1984, quote, whites had created the problem, it was up to whites to fix it, and there was very little in the dialogue that treated blacks as responsible actors, close yes. quote. Yes. Has that changed? No, it has not. All right. On, on we go. <laughs> <laughs> the passing scene. Your friend, your longtime friend, Walter Williams. Now we come to current politics. The bottom line is that President Donald Trump does not have the personal character that we would want our children to imitate, but save his misguided international trade policies, has turned out to be a good president. Tom? I think his policies have been, by and large, have been uh, policies that were far better than that of previous Democratic or Republican administrations. So the, 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 I go by the consequences. Okay. I mean, he, he, he hasn't produced the right rhetoric, but the fact is that uh, uh, unemployment among low-income people, black, Hispanic included, uh, I, I, uh, is, a, is at a level that is far lower than it's been in uh, decades. Uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the economy is booming in a way that uh, no one had predicted. I, uh, people like uh, Paul, uh, Paul Krugman were saying that when uh, Trump gets in, the economy is going to tank. No, uh, the economy took, hit new highs. Right. But, but, there, but, but, but there, there are so many people among the intel, intelligentsia, especially, who are absolutely immune to facts. It's as, as, if, they, it's as if they took their uh, anti-fact shots uh, every, every, every year, and uh, the facts will just not affect them. So oh, th this brings us back. I can understand. I mean, I really can My understanding is limited, which is why I'm going to put this in the form of a question. I can understand the never-Trumpers mm -hmm. who don't, don't bother me with economic boom because this man is on my television screen every single night and I can't stand him. I can understand, I can see that impulse. I can, I can understand what this they This is feel. the second consecutive president of the United States that I automatically turn off when I'm watching to on television. <laughs> All right. Keep the remote right next to oh, your yes. hand. Okay. Who was the first? Obama. Got it. Uh, you're totally bipartisan in that regard. Oh, huh? always. <laughs> no other but, way. But the great society, the larger point that you've been making here the Great Society, the War on Poverty, this is now six decades of experience. Yes. And we have, as you have said, the gap hasn't closed. We've got uh, dissolution of the family structure, rising crime rates. That I don't understand. How can it be that the people, I, now I don't know how to remain bipartisan, but Democrats, liberals, the progressives, just are not, the evidence is in. This has not worked. Why, after half, more than half a century, there's still a refusal to look at the evidence. Yes, and, and, and there's even a tendency to falsify the evidence. And how come? I think people become uh, attached to a vision, and uh, that really warps the way they see the world. Human beings have an enormous capacity to rationalize. Yeah. All right. Again, notes on the passing scene. An article from the New York Times just a couple of days ago, quote, now this is a longish quotation, but it's important to lay out the facts here. Over the last decade, the charter school movement gained significant foothold in New York. The movement hoped to set a national example if charter schools could make it in a deep blue state like New York, they could make it anywhere. Over 100,000 students in the, in, in the city's charter schools are doing well on state tests, and tens of thousands are on waiting lists. But the election, the election of, of this November, suggested that the golden era of charter schools is over. The insurgent Democrats, Democrats did well across New York, but especially in the state Senate, have repeatedly expressed hostility to the movement. Close quote. And Tom Sowell res responds to that set of facts how? Oh, it, it, that, that really is one of the moral outrages. 
that for many kids who are cut from a very poor background and who parents may not have had much education, a decent education is the one thing they have to have to, to have a better life. And these schools have been absolutely uh, spectacular. Uh, the charter schools. The charter schools. The, the successful ones. Now, there are a few that, that weren't. But, uh, uh, for example, a, a few years ago, uh, on, the, on the statewide, New York statewide math tests, there was an elementary school, grade uh, four, I believe, in Harlem, which, whose students passed those tests at a higher rate than any fourth grade kids anywhere in the state of New York. I mean, we're talking Scarsdale, Briarcliff, places like that. Uh, the Success Academy schools as a whole, uh, their students pass in both the math and the English statewide tests at a higher rate than any school system, school district in the entire state of New York. Uh, the vast majority of the kids in the Success Academy schools are either black or Hispanic. Uh, if, you, if you look at the five uh, highest scoring uh, district, school districts in the state in terms of the percentage of the students who pass the math or the English test, uh, their average family income ranges from four, t four times that of the kids in the Success Academy schools to more than nine times the family income of the kids in the academies, Success Academy schools. And yet, the mayor of New York is doing his darndest to, to, to put a stop to the expansion of, uh, of schools in general, but his special ire is aimed at the Success Academy schools. And this is happening all over the country. Because they make the, the teachers' unions look bad that run the public schools? What, what, what's the political motivation? Why would Mayor de Blasio have an out for the charter schools, such as Success Academy? Well, the teachers union are the, are the major reason. Uh, and the, we're talking about the, the money they contribute, the number of votes they contribute. Uh, and the, the schools, and, what, and what's happening, again, not just in New York, but in other parts of the country, including California, is that they, 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 they have all, there's all kind of chicanery uh, to prevent the charter schools from expanding. That's why you have tens of thousands on the waiting list. It's not that the charter schools are not willing to expand, but every conceivable obstacle is put in their way. Because if you let that go at the natural pace, it would be very hard for the public schools to compete. And one of the things they're doing is imposing the same kinds of restrictions on the, on, on the charter schools that, that made this public school so bad. For example, restrictions on being able to get rid of kids who are, who are, who are running amok and, and, and ruining the education of everybody else. And the charter schools don't tolerate that. Uh, the, t the things that are tolerated in the public schools are unbelievable. Uh, so when I asked you a moment ago, how do we bring back the the standards of the Harlem in which you grew up? The answer is that's a hard thing to do. but. We do know how to do one thing. We do know how to establish schools where the kids in present-day Harlem have a shot, they yeah. have a chance of getting a good education. Yeah, you don't have to bring back the past, uh, even if you could, uh, uh, because we have it in the present. We have, the, we have this happening. And so we know how to do that, and the Democratic establishment in New York wants to shut it down. Yes. And the Republican establishment stands mute. Stands mute. You know, I love talking to you, but I really don't know why. It's all, <laughs> it's all discouraging. Tom, you mentioned again, a, a moment ago the, um, the way young Americans uh, flock to Bernie Sanders. I Gallup poll this summer. The proportion of Americans age 18 to 29 that holds a favorable view of capitalism, 45%. The proportion that holds a favorable view of socialism, 51%. Now. I would like you to take a look at a brief video of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who at the age of 29, calling herself a democratic socialist, has just been elected to the House of Representatives from New York. And although she's not seated yet in the new Congress, she went to Washington, and one of her first acts was to participate in a sit-in in the offices of House Majority Leader Nancy Pelosi, that is to say, her, the leader of her own party. Yes. So here's a brief video. I just want to let you all know how 
proud I am of each and every single one of you for putting yourselves and your bodies and, and everything on the line to make sure that we save our planet, our generation, and our future. And it's so incredibly important. We have to get to 100% renewable energy in 10 years. There is no other option. Tom, <laughs> to her supporters, to the supporters of Bernie Sanders, to young Americans, what would you say? I would say, get, get, get some facts first, know what you're talking about before you start spouting out this kind of stuff. Ask the question. One of the things I do in a new new book is I suggest that, uh, uh, that there's, a, there's a certain uh, opinion about what happened in the 1920s with the taxes were cut from the highest tax rate was cut down from 73% to 24%. And the argument was, oh, this is tax cuts for the rich. And I have suggested that uh, a students and, and that uh, the Secretary of the Treasury did this in, in, in support of us, trickle-down theory and so forth. And I suggested that the students would be a wonderful project to go read what the Secretary of the Treasury actually said. Andrew Mellon in the 1920s yes. about these tax cuts. And then uh, go, go on the Internet and get the... Uh, uh, internal revenue official uh, data on who paid how much taxes in the 1920s. And it turns out if you do that, you find that Andrew Mellon said that the exact opposite of what he is attributed, it is attributed to him in textbooks that have been uh, sold widely for decades on end through successive uh, 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 editions. And what you'll find is that in the, and when the tax rate was at 73%, uh, the, the people who are making over uh, $100,000 a year, and that, that's maybe a couple of million in, in today's money, uh, paid 30% of the taxes. And after the so-called tax cuts for the rich, they paid 65% of all the taxes. <laughs> and the people with incomes under $5,000, which is also was a nice income in those days, uh, who, who were paying 15% uh, when the tax rate was, was uh, cut. But before the tax check was cut, and after it was cut, they paid uh, just under a quarter of one percent of all the taxes. And so we hear how, and so there's all kinds of indignation in these scholarly books. We're not talking about just political propaganda. Uh, how this this was a bonanza for the rich and so on, and uh, people with ordinary incomes paid practically nothing in income tax after the tax cuts. And though, and millionaires, uh, the share of millionaires was. Uh, I think 4% before that, and, and, and it was 19% afterwards. Uh, and, but, the, but the facts simply do not matter. They, they say these words, they say trickle down, and it's like saying abracadabra, and, and, and all the miraculous things follow from that. Tom Sowell, author of a forthcoming edition of Discrimination and Disparities, would you close by reading a brief quotation from your 1987 book, one of my favorites, A Conflict of Visions? Logic, of course, is not the only test of a theory. Empirical evidence is crucial. And yet social visions have shown a remarkable ability to evade, suppress, or explain away discordant evidence. Historic evasions of evidence are a warning, not a model. Dedication to a cause may legitimately entail sacrifices of personal interests, but not sacrifices of mind or conscience. Dr. Thomas Sowell, thank you. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution, and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson. All right, people. So we're going to expound on this. That's, that's a little bit. We're not going to go deep into it because I want you guys, like I said, to watch the video and listen to Dr. Thomas Sowell. He's definitely going to explain to you much better than I can. But uh, one thing I want to touch on is the fact that um, Thomas Saul is not a communist, but he is bipartisan. Like, he doesn't care whether it's Democrat or Republican. He just wants the right thing to be done. As you saw when this comment when he said that uh, there's a second president um, back to and, and back to back that I have when I have turned off the television when they come on TV. Meaning he wasn't a big Obama fan as well as he wasn't a Trump fan. It's a whole lot of stuff that this 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 man is speaking that is true, depending on how you want to accept it, how you want to take it. 
But what he's saying is absolutely positively true. Um, we live in a society where no one, whether it's Democrat or Republican, is doing the right thing to make the situation right. So I hope you guys got some out of this. I hope you understood this. Uh, you guys' comments are more than welcome. In fact, they are encouraged. So please um, drop your comments down below. Let me know how you feel. Uh, don't worry, I'll come. I'll respond to all comments. Doesn't matter. We definitely want to talk about this and see how you feel about this in the second part of this um, reaction video. So, guys, let's go ahead and discuss this a little bit. See what we come up with. Let me know your feelings about uh, Dr. Thomas Saul and uh, his theory on uh, econ uh, economic inequality. I want to know your input on what you feel about it. A lot of us are not knowledgeable in that. Uh, air to expertise is understandable. Give me your simplified input on what you think about it. Make let me understand. Show me what you think about. It. Let me know that you paid attention to what he was saying, and um, let's share our thoughts and ideas uh, on this on this on this topic. So once again, guys, I am your man, Mr. CRT man. I want to thank all of you starting by taking out checking out. Um, Charles Real Talk Podcast. We keep it real. We keep it authentic. We keep it 100. Real talk, real people, real topics. Man, it's also going to be on my other channel, um, RRV TV, where we we have, re that, those are all our reaction videos there. You guys want to look and check that out as well. It's going to be on my Facebook ch uh, channel as well. So you can check it out at Charles Thornton as well. Uh, let me know what you think about it. And the podcast will be on Spotify Radio as well as uh, Twitter as well. So, thank you guys for stopping by. I hope I hope you guys got as much out of this as I did. I definitely got a lot out of it. I'm really impressed with what he was saying. We're going to do another video on Dr. Thomas Saul next week. We're going to get into some other some other stuff here soon. Uh, so, be looking for the next video very, very soon, guys. Uh, we're on our way to 50,000 subscribers, man, with you guys' help, man. Really appreciate it. Once again, I'm your man, Mr. Charles. Of those who on my RV television station, Mr. CRV, Mr. CRT, coming to you live, man. And I want to say thank you, guys. Be blessed. And as always, peace.